Awake living into uncharted territory. Together. Accelerating your wellness path. Plus, your interconnectivity at the same time. It's not your grandmother, your Veda, but it kind of is. It's the Yoga Healer Real Life Show with Kate Stillman. Hello and welcome back to the Yoga Healer Real Life Show. Today's a special episode. We're hitting 1 million downloads with this episode, which is exciting to me in the sense that the conversation's growing and that you're you're into it and that we're sharing it and then we get we get great guests because we have great numbers, which is kind of weird, but it's sort of how it works. Today's episode, we have Jason Niemer, the co-founder of Acro Yoga. If anyone doesn't know who Jason is, it's actually fun to check him out on YouTube and go back to his his like before Acro Yoga videos, to his acrobatics yoga videos to see where Acro Yoga really came from, this mixture of acrobatics and and yoga and and partnering. And what you will hear in this episode today with Jason is how yoga deepens when we do it with other people. Like when it's not just us alone on our mat, but what happens when we're working with another person, when we're playing with another person, when we're spotting to other people in a practice. We get into sacred geometry and the magic of the number three, the smallest community and what goes on when community is functional. So there's a lot of deep yoga philosophy packed into this short conversation with Jason Niemer. I'm excited to intersect with him in Guadalajara next fall. If you're curious about, you know, meeting up with him and going to one of his trainings, just go to acroyoga.com and you'll see he is all over the world. Today's podcast is brought to you by Awake Living. If you are operating at a higher level of consciousness, if you know how to take care of your body, then you are eligible to apply for your free Awake Living coaching session at yogahealer.com forward slash awake. We're coaching peeps who want to optimize their time, hit their goals, up their game, refine relationship resonance, and expand their wealth. Check it out at yogahealer.com forward slash await. This offer is time limited, so act now. All right, without further ado, Jason Niemer. You look so happy. I'm happy. Today's podcasting day. I like that. I like happy. Yeah. So one day a week, I get to just hang out and find out what's happening in in yoga world. Nice. uh, Yeah. It's it's so exciting to uh, just you know be able to be in one place and yet tap into this global conversation and and how appropriate (laughs) to be talking to you, who you're quite the globe. I'm the opposite. Trotter. (laughs) <laughs> I plug into many places and get to drop into people like you and share what I find out in the world. Yeah. So what are you like? What's the conversation that's going on in your world right now? <sighs> wow. That's a that's an open ended big question. Um, I think the main thing that I see and that I experience in the world is just there's there's a lot of chaos in the world right now. And there's on on the big picture politically and just if you look at what's happening in the world there's a lot of tumultuous energy and i think it's driving people to find smaller communities that can feed them and that can be the type of environment that governments haven't been able to provide for us yet so i find that there's a lot of self-reliant small groups of people that are co-creating the type of environment that they want to live in and the yoga bubble is one of the first communities that i experienced that have that where I travel all over, whether it's China, Africa, Europe, America, South America, there's this tribe of, you know, quasi vegetarian, meditating, asana type humans that have a commonality that has gone across the globe. So yeah, I feel that the main thing that I'm experiencing is these small distillations of wisdom communities that are supporting each other in ways that I don't think governments will be a, ever be able to. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense too, right? Because it's like this return to the tribal and that value structure that a tribe has and having a zillion tribes now, right? That are having a particular conversation according to a certain value structure that may be codified or not, right? Where they may, but they're, it's there, whether they've actually turned it into a, into a code of what, of what we eat, of how we are together, of, mm-hmm. of how we 
you know, what our perspective is, what our inquiries are. And, and, Agreed. So, and, it, and it seems like technology is what, I mean, it's so interesting, right? Where we have the actual technology of technology, just like we're using Skype right now and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the technology of the ancient wisdoms, right? Where we now have the merging of the two. So we can have a really specific conversation. Yeah. And I think it's one of my friends gave a great analogy and she said, do you remember when cell phones came out and there were these huge bricks with these huge antennas <laughs> and they were just clumsy, clunky technology. And to some degree, her analogy was the way we're using technology, we're the clunky teenagers that are being awkward with how to use it in an intelligent, enlightening kind of way or life enhancing kind of way. Right now, I think myself and most of the people I know are trying to step away from technology, um, impulsive patterns, and find a way that the life balance and the technology can be in harmony. And I think personally, I'm sure I have another three to five years of deep work to do to find that balance. Mm -hmm. You know, how many of us wake up and the first thing we do is we look at our phone before we, you know, look at our partner or look at our yoga mats or anything. It's we go straight to the phone and, you know, it's because we want to be connected. And one of the benefits that I get to feel in, in my life, in my communities and my practices is we have real human connection often. And one of the phrases we say is put your phones down and pick your friends up and yeah, I feel like that's something that a lot of us are going to be finding our balance with. When I, one of the things that I'm noticing, too, in that is that like there's a our circles have never really crossed. We have different global tribes. And yet the the thread of the conversation is the same. And it's all about connectivity. Right. That what mm -hmm. we're finding at this emerging edge of of consciousness is like as people get into their bodies and they discover their physiology, they discover their breath, they discover their own interconnectivity, then their capacity to actually connect with each other increases. And then after that facility is, uh, is, is uh, access, then there's a co-creative potential that starts to happen. And if I see like what's going on around the, you know, like just how the yoga world has evolved over the last, particularly the last 20 years, there's such an explosion of creativity. Yeah. And you have some people that are like very resistant to that, of course, right? Mm -hmm. you know, the, the tried and true mm -hmm. side uh, that think there's one way. And then and then on the other side, you have this understanding, a, a physiological based understanding of energetics. And then you have this increase in connectivity, human to human, and you have so much co-creativity then blossoming out of that. And you guys are at the yeah, I mean, that's that the whole Leela component of that, of the co-creative energy has mm -hmm. It has a playfulness. It has a desire of exploration. Totally. It has a curiosity built into it. So, what, yeah, I just would love to hear what your experiences are in this. Well, I agree 100% that the deeper people go in their yoga practice, the more connected they are to the subtle energies, the gross energies, the emotions, the, the prayers. All these things are constantly mixing in our bodies and our practices. But I don't think that the deeper we go with our self-knowledge by you know, default, we just share that with other people. I think that's one of the things that Acro Yoga and a lot of other practices have helped yogis do is take their individual wisdom and share it with other people. And as far as the mixing of different uh, types of yoga, I was at a yoga festival in India years ago, and it was so amazing to see all the different types of Westerners and the different types of Indian yogis. There were some sadhus that were in their robes and doing very traditional yoga. And there were some, there was a guy that did Bollywood yoga and we danced our asses off and then did some yoga at the end. And it was like, wow, that's an Indian guy that's taking yoga in a different direction. Then there was a Westerner, I think a guy was from England who taught a super traditional Ashtanga type yoga class and everything in between. And then there's the acro yoga, like, who are these freaks? Well, you know, we're all freaky in the ways that we express our humanity. And I think that a lot of times people will identify with, I am this kind of yogi, therefore yeah. I will dress this way, I will be this way. And they don't actually get pure access to their essence. They actually have this yoga cloak over them to protect them. So they pick up and they trade in one identity for another. Yeah. I mean, it's worth noting that, you know, the concept of Svatantria, of being, of being so free to be beyond an identity, right? And this whole concept of shape-shifting or reinvention where there's a, 
like something fits for a phase, but then can we notice then what's emerging next and not be attached to anything that's been in the past, including the truths that we maybe held very close? Yeah, and you could do one yoga practice for 15 years, and on that first day of the 16th year, you wake up and you're just like, I don't want to do this at all. It's not feeding me in any way, shape, or form. This is actually a cage. And what's awesome about current modern yoga is there are so many different styles of yoga, and you can be a shapeshifter. Personally, I do believe in going super deep in yeah. practices and not just, you know, flavor of the week yoga. Uh, and everyone has their own journey with all practices. But for me, I love going super, super deep with simple poses that have an infinite amount of wisdom. And there are other people that they get fed by doing a lot of creative movement every week. So I think it is like like we're both agreeing very individual what feeds us yeah i mean but the, the whole depth versus span conversation right like this is the depth versus span right if you're you know that whole analogy of if you're gonna if you're gonna dig a well and find water you don't want to just dig like 100 holes <laughs> you mm -hmm. take one one deep but maybe enough. you dig 20 because on the 20th one that's where you find your nectar right yeah yeah but that sense of of knowing what uh you're after so that yeah. there's a an inner detector that you're not just getting distracted by the next, the next new thing. shiny object. Yeah. The next shiny object. So yeah. with let's, let's talk about when we do yoga together, when we're mm -hmm. connecting with other bodies as our mm -hmm. practice as part of our practice and the gateways that, that open in that, that really aren't open when we're isolated on our mat. Mm -hmm. So what are, I mean, what are some of your biggest, deepest ahas? And Well, I think it's, to me, both acrobatics, all three, acrobatics, yoga, and healing arts, the most important component in all of those is listening, is receptivity. And that might be least obvious to people in the acrobatics. They might think, well, no, it's about power and strength. But if you start with listening, then you can guide your power and your strength and there's kind of a few different veins of acro yoga that we explore. One is the acrobatics where both people are muscularly engaged and taking risks. And there's a huge trust component. And there's a lot of uh, happy dances and conversions of fear into joy. So as far as the healing aspects go, it's not that all the healing happens in the healing arts. It could be that you drop into partner yoga and you learn how to connect your breath with another person and you realized, wow, I've never done that before. I've never listened to a breath rhythm with two people at the same time and let that be the practice. So in the therapeutics, um, what the potential is, is for one person's body to be passive and the other person to be investigating and being active. And the analogy that I love is basically in all of them, we're balancing bodies in acrobatics. We physically balance a body in yoga. We balance bodies by balancing our fire and our lunar energy, balancing our strength and our flexibility. And then in the healing arts, we physically balance our friends bodies by doing these practices, these mindful meditations of pouring body weights and interacting in a skillful way that helps both people when they get done feel better. Yeah. Yeah. And do you find when people come in, like they come in for one and they get all three and, and they're surprised at what they really, you know, like they often, what they really needed wasn't necessarily what they. Right. Well, it's, it's three infinite practices yeah. that are being blended. So the, the depth of practice is always going to be there. And yeah, there's one of my friends, Laura, she lives in Puerto Rico and she came to the first Acro Yoga teacher training and she's, you know, this spicy Latina and she hated the massage and the therapeutics. She's like, whatever, I'm all about the yoga and the acrobatics. And maybe four years later, she met some billionaire Russian yacht people in Puerto Rico. She's like, well, yeah, I could give you a massage. And boom, she started doing a lot of massage. And now she's opened a massage studio in Puerto Rico. And she's studied all over the world in Thailand. And she loves it. And, you know, you can't force people to learn what you think they need. A lot of times the bad choices, quote unquote, bad choices that we make that create injury or create big imbalances are the catalyst for 
the change, the deeper change that we really need. So, you know, in yoga with Shiva and change being the predominant figure, whatever choices you make, as long as you're evolving, you're, you're practicing your yoga and it's not always an easy ride. Sometimes it's bumpy. (laughs) Sometimes. (laughs) Oftentimes. I love uh, the phrase that, you know, if you're not uncomfortable, you're probably not evolving, which is sort of the opposite of that. They're like Leela playfulness which it's like that's sort of the balm on the on the wounds of the of the bumps that we if we really are truly on a on a growth path that we'll encounter so when you know when the shy people come and they're apprehensive of you know maybe they have a very well developed personal practice and they Mm -hmm. they know that they need to connect more in life and and one of their barriers is is intimacy right one or one of the things that they don't experience in their relationships and they hear that like oh this is a really safe space to start to actually experience other people where you're not in a maybe in a um you know in a sexual relationship or in a partnership uh that might be more conventional right and they start to can you can you kind of walk through some of the what that looks like for the person in the journey for them? Sure. It, what I see is I see adults turn into children often. And, you know, just like at junior high when you're at the dance and you're kind of, you know, looking down and a little shy, like, I really want to dance, but I don't want to ask you. And uh, I was just in Jamaica and I don't really know why, but Jamaican culture they're very shy to try acro yoga, but when they do, they freak out. And basically what I see, I love physics and I love math and science. And I love this idea of energy can't be created or destroyed. There's potential energy and kinetic energy. And let's say somebody has been wanting to connect with another human, whether it's having a, a partner, a lover, a friend, whatever it is, there's that desire and the, the fear that gets built up. And as soon what we do in acro yoga that I think has made the practice expand around the world is it's very linear it's very approachable and when we think about safety there's physical safety but there's also emotional safety i wouldn't do a super intimate move with somebody who's never done the practice as a as a first handshake and we've actually for about five years now developed this part of acro yoga that we call acro fit and this is a fitness version of acro yoga that doesn't have the holding hands and chanting ohms and very low body contact and it's just helping you realize that you and one other person or two other people can use your body weight and experience an amazing connection so it's it's about the layering and the invitation and you know we can't force anybody to do anything and people's desires will be met when they're ready to step forward and take the leap but we create a very soft environment and everything we do especially with beginners is base flyer spotter so it's not just two people it's three people getting together as a little nucleus as a little community and they all change roles so you get compassion for the fear of the flyer the instability of the base and as a spotter you get to see the interaction between the two and just learn a lot from being the the outside eye yeah right so it's like you're both the witness and you're the you have a responsibility develops so compassion it's interesting right because it's like there's this there's this duality between two people and then there's the there's the trilogy right there's the dynamic change with the the third and being into physics like that seems to be uh it, it seems to be like an essential equation right of like for, in order sacred for, geometry yeah it's the triangle triangles are stable um basically everything starts with yourself and the more you know about yourself and the more you do your individual work, then when you come into partnership, you have that, that potential uh, to be an amazing partner. And then it's practice. And to be a good partner, you have to listen to yourself, your own truths. You have to be able to listen to your partner's truth. And then when you get into a group of three, this is the smallest community. So whatever dynamic you learn in a group of three, it's the same in 30, 30 million. It doesn't change in the essence of now we have to listen, but we have to step forward and we have to do different roles to support the greater good of what these three people are moving towards. Yeah. Yeah. And so when people report back from what they learn, their big ahas in that group of three, and then they bring it home and, and it, and it starts to, right. In many ways, it's like they're wearing a new, they're wearing a new perspective. They have a new pair of glasses on. Right. And, and it's a perspective that's fed from the physical body. Wisdom right. is is something that is achieved 
from experience. And the physical body, fortunately, is very clear to understand. There's very, uh, the, the binary messages. I like, I don't like, I trust, I don't trust. So as we access the wisdom of our bodies and share it verbally afterwards with our friends, like, oh, okay, this is, this is what it feels like. Cool. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So my background's in Ayurvedic medicine and uh, this, you know, root cause of disease is basically a failure to learn from the body, mm. right? A failure cool. to, it's uh, they call it, a, I think it's misinterpreted a lot, but it's, it's, uh, it's pragna parata, which is this, this failure of, of the intellect is how it's often translated, but it's, it's not really, to me, it's just like a, it's just not really, it's just not taking that time to reflect and incorporate. It's like just not mm. that absorption component. It's like Shavasana and yoga. You love Shavasana enough mm -hmm. and you're not going to, like it's, there's, there's not that, uh, it's like how the rain needs to saturate the earth before the new uh, seed can sprout. Right. It's like, you're not getting that. that. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I, for me, in Chinese medicine, the definition of pain is stagnation. It's when things don't move. But what I love about what you're saying is you're incorporating the mind or the assimilation of the experience as either the health or lack of health. And that seems a lot more all-encompassing of our human experience because it's not just our bones and our muscles and our guts and our organs that are creating or not creating our health. If the mind isn't incorporated and the emotions aren't incorporated, it's very sterile and scientific Western medicine, but that is not the full picture of who we are. And it blows my mind how narrow many Westerners see health and their health practices, just ice water. I mean, if we just take ice water out of your repertoire, <laughs> people, I mean, I will drink a Coke from time to time and I enjoy it for my emotional body, but I, I understand a lot of the Ayurvedic things that help the body and yeah. you bringing up the mind and the emotions is huge. Yeah. And just that, right. Yeah. And, and the taking that trilogy of the, what's learned in that, in the, in the small, like you said, the smallest, the smallest form of community is three. We have an insight from the practice in our body. We have an aha of, of how to connect with ourselves and mm -hmm. how to connect with other people. All of a sudden we're experiencing more intimacy. We're realizing that we're awakening our capacities of sense, right? All our senses are now much more plugged in. So the mm -hmm. realizations that we're having when we're then maybe we're at work or maybe then we're at the dinner table with our family or whatever, like all of a sudden we have a whole new level of capacity if we've absorbed the practice together, right? In a way exactly. that we can't do if we're just practicing on our own. It's not, it's going yeah. to be a different learning. At the same time, the more that you get intoxicated with the partner practices, you're like, oh my God, this is all I want to do. Right. Same thing as in partnership. The yeah. deeper we go in partnership, we need to sit on our mats. We need to yeah. reconnect and reconfirm. This is who I am and I'm not getting lost in the partnership and I'm not getting lost in the community. I still... I'm going to spend my time each day connecting with who I am now. Yeah, that's that Svadhyaya part, right? If you take out the mm -hmm. self-study, you're, self you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about, too, just about, you know, this sense of what I see emerging, and it seems like what you've devoted your life to is really the skill of building around connection and in community and like you identified at first in the conversation just how there's a lot of like what we're realizing is community now it has something to do with the neighborhood we live in but it has a lot more to do with the in my experience it has a lot more to do with the conversations that really spark us like what, what are the sparky conversations for for the individual to start to to notice to awaken and to develop um some access of like who's also having this conversation who also has these values Where's that community going? I need to get on that, on that bus, right? Like that's, instead of trying to go with like least common denominator factor of just like who's around me and trying to, you know, trying to bring everyone up from, which is, I mean, it's to me, it's like, a, it's like this, you know, it's like the self-study and the group practice. It's like, it's a, it's a yes and both. But if we're, if we're trying to bring everyone up around us, and I know a lot of people who go to these, you know, they go to yoga event, they go to yoga teacher training, they they have a peak experience, they have a breakthrough, they come home, they crash, they have a really hard time assimilating their, their wisdom and they don't have the stability. They haven't uh, found the community and they don't know how to tap in, whether it's, even if it's a virtual community, right? 
uh, to right. support the level of consciousness that they had, right? To support the learnings they had and the reality that they had. And so then they start to feel like they're out of integrity with themselves because they know better from what they learned. And yet they're not able to apply it because they're not around a, a community that can self sustain that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I guess one of the things that I just am wanting to, uh, to go into is the sense of building capacity and relationship, because sometimes it's not the people you live with. It might not be the people that like are in your physical locality. You may have to like go and yeah. travel to develop these skills and you might need to repeatedly plug in until those skills become stable. So what, yeah, and I'm ahead. sure, I'm sure you've seen this happen a number of times where people will go to a yoga teacher training when they come home, their relationships and their friends change. They basically, evolve in a different direction uh, than where they were before. And I think the more that I do my yoga practices and the more that I see people around the world doing their, doing their work, there is a distillation of wisdom as this is who I am. And because I'm understanding who I am and because I'm interacting with a lot of other people, there's the potential to not only accept, but love people where they are and not have to be in this elitist group of super sattvic yogis to be happy. You can be with somebody who has very different views and very different lifestyle. And you can be like, wow, you like apples too? Let's eat some apples and just meet people where they are versus being a, a yoga snob and like, oh, I am so pure and I am so this because <laughs> I've done this for 10 years. I think there's a lot of, it happens in religion, happens in yoga, it happens in everything where when people get very devoted to something, it creates separation. And the, the essence of yoga and the essence of acro yoga is how do you find and elevate each other's connection? Well, I would say that's more acro yoga than yoga by design, but I think the potential of yogis is to be really brilliant and bright in who you are and look for that in other people. You know, namaste is not just something you say after a yoga class necessarily. It can be wow, there's so much vibration in all of the beings that are around and looking for that and supporting that versus feeling now that I have this elevated vibration, I can't connect to the garbage man. Like the garbage man probably has wisdom that you have no idea. And I think that the, the possibilities of opening your, your eyes and heart to all the magic that's around you and all the crap that's around you and being able to discern what the best action is. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We're going to take a little break. And when we are back, you'll hear Jason talk about the evolution of his dharma and his impact. You've done some serious work. You're operating at a higher level of consciousness. You know how to take care of your body. You'd like to uplevel other aspects in your life, your space, your time, your dharma, your flow, and your body. Ether, air, fire, water, earth. I'm taking a posse of peeps into the Awake Living course. 50 people will be selected to join this expedition. We're opening the doors to anyone who is feeling great and wants to uplevel how they align their life, time optimization, space alignment, hitting goals, wealth expansion, and day-to-day -day ease. If you're interested in Awake Living, we have a super fun process for you to experience. Go to yogahealer.com forward slash awake. Sign up for your free Awake Living coaching session. During your free Awake Living coaching session, you will refine the next version of you. As a bonus, you'll receive the 60-minute workshop, Insider Scoop, on how I optimize my day as a yoga mom, tribe leader, and social entrepreneur. Go to yogahealer.com forward slash awake and sign up for your free Awake Living coaching session. You know, to me, it's like a yes and. It's like and simultaneously being able to plug into where there's a lot of growth potential. So to me, For it's sure. like both, right? So it's like you're you're elevating a conversation because you have a number of people that are super skillful and they've developed these skills by being with each other and experimenting and growing capacities. And then, yeah, it's like then you have the real world measure of like, how's your yoga? Just go to the grocery store and find out. Find out how your practice <laughs> Go is. hang out with your family. Go, hang go out, to yeah. Thanksgiving. Go to Thanksgiving. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And, and, and it seems like what's happening now, it seems like we've hit a critical mass where at least I'm seeing a, cr a critical mass that I hadn't seen a decade ago, where there is a level of, of um, being grounded in this, in this self and not needing, in, in not needing people to get it, not needing people to understand, but just living in the light of your own truth. And then that, the light mm -hmm. just enables more connectivity. And, and to me, that, that really speaks to, I think, our our generation and this creativity that's happening and, and us getting that like, 
wow, when we find someone that's on the same wavelength, like that depth of connection, we get to we get to experience that and then we get to practice it in all of our more mundane everyday relationships with our kids and our spouses and our neighbors and and we get to see how how quickly we can connect. One of the things I'm I'm really noticing this week, this particular week is this um like the, I'm calling it the transference of of uh, of trust where if if you know someone is trustworthy via another source, you can instantly just like really open your heart to a new level. Right? That can yeah. be a, a, a practice, and then we can and we can extend that like all the way through to like every human being, just through knowing that the essence of a human is is to be trustworthy. And maybe that person's been violated a number of times, and therefore is is afraid and shut down and and broken mm-hmm. in some way. But we can still transfer our, our trust in humanity, right? To human or one of the ways that I practice this is with plants. Um, I'm really into invasive weeds and the, and like trust. <laughs> I've never heard anyone say that before. <laughs> oh, it's not my, it's not an original thought. Um, my, the le- thought leader in this area is Katrina Blair and she wrote the wisdom of wild weeds and I live, and I live rurally. And uh, so I get to experience a lot of agriculture and invasive. Awesome. Weed. Yeah. Right. But we all do. Cause everywhere in every neighborhood, there's invasive weeds and they're saying, about 13 plants uh, dominating around the planet. But this whole idea that we can trust, right? So if we look, it doesn't matter if it's a human, it doesn't matter if it's a plant, it doesn't matter if it's the sky, the earth, the water, right? If we can actually get to a place of trusting the cosmos that created us, like trusting the five elements that are part of our our physiology and everywhere around us, trusting each other, like trusting what's arising in our life, we're going to be a much more human being right like we're going to be in a relaxed flow of awakened consciousness where the potentiality for connection is going to be that much greater and therefore we're not like hamstringing our own capacity by construction yeah i think trust is one of my favorite topics i deal with it often um and i i really respect the process of developing trust and the process of assessing risks correctly and understanding where are my fears coming from. And, you know, I, I've been in the ocean a lot recently. I did a triathlon for the first time. And as I was training, I'm thinking about sharks. Like, why am I thinking about sharks? Is this really realistic? How often do sharks eat, you know, humans that are swimming in the Caribbean ocean? So it's not very logical, but it takes it takes some mental gymnastics to understand, okay, this is a fear and I can't I can't deny it but I can play with it and I can work with it. And, you know, I think one thing that I've done a lot in my life is I've been able to assess risk intelligently and that is a skill. And the better you get at that skill, the more trust potential you have. And, you know, trust isn't something that can be demanded. It has to be something that's exchanged step by step and people that are skillful and trustworthy, they have a vibration. And you can feel that vibration or that lack of vibration. It's called confidence. If people are confident in what they're doing, you're going to feel more at ease. And what's cool about trust is it's a currency that both people win when it's exchanged. When you give trust, you feel lighter. You feel free. When you receive trust, you get grounded in that confidence. So it's it's really one of the most magical things that people exchange. And it's it's never going to be, it's never going to go out of style. It's, you are never going to run out of the need to exchange trust and to know how to interact skillfully with it. Yeah. So as we, as we like circle back to the beginning of the conversation and the amount of uncertainty and fear people are feeling as you travel the, the planet and, and connect and share and teach. And, and you're seeing this not just in one part of the world, but in, in all these different continents, right? It's like, can there, can there be a trust in, in these interesting times. I mean, we truly live in, in this pretty wild time. Like that's <sighs> no un- joke. unprecedented. No joke. Wow. But, but what I see so much is this contract, this like base, it's like a baseline operating system contraction against reality. I call it exist like this existential anxiety. And most people don't realize mm-hmm. they have it. Mm-hmm. Right. But it shows up in our, spe- it shows up in how we, our viewpoint that shows up in our speech. It shows up in, how quick can we dive into a conversation that's sparky for both people, right? It shows up in so, so many ways. It shows up when we like handshake or hug, like, is there truly mm-hmm. an open 
flow happening, right? Or is it guarded? Is there protection? Is there a, right. is there a, is there a contraction against reality? Right. And, and some people would say like, yeah, but there should be, cause it's scary. Like it's yeah. really unknown. It's scary. But my sense, like this is a measure of our practice of uh, the power of our, of our practice, however we define our practice uh, of being a human and, is that we start to actually trust like, wow, I was born, I was born in interesting times. Like I was born in a pretty unpredictable world. Like, yeah, well, that's always been the case, right? That's always been the case. I mean, you, you can't predict much of what's going to happen each day other than the sun is going to rise and set. And, you know, there are some fixed things that happen. Gravity is pretty fixed. Everything else <laughs> is, uh, is the magic of life. And I think where when I got deep into my yoga studies, there was about a five-year period where I didn't watch movies. I didn't look at the news. I didn't care about that. I just wanted to go inside. And I think where I'm at now is, um, you know, in the past six months specifically, I've been more conscious of what type of media I'm consuming, what type of conversations I'm having. And if I'm in a negative place talking about negative things, that's what I'm attracting. And so I think it's the ability to not completely shut out what's happening in the world, but let your world be the five people that you're hanging out with that day. And how much can you learn from them and how much can you elevate them and how much support for the greater good can you guys cultivate? And it is conversation by conversation. Are you watching the news? Or are you watching SNL about the news? I'm going to choose SNL. I think it's amazing <laughs> totally. how much comedy has come through and I don't really need to see every day what is happening around the world because they're going to feed this machine of fear. It's very clear that our governments are with a very clear plan of scaring the shit out of us. And yeah. day to day, I don't experience the type of fear and grim reality that I watch on CNN if I choose to do that. Yeah. So I don't think it's shutting out what's happening, but you can interact with it in many different ways. And if it's, you know, every day you're talking doomsday, you know, people have been talking about nuclear wars since the 50s. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And it's like the shark. If I know that there are sharks in the water, that's one thing. If I'm terrified of a shark every time I go in the water, life in the water ceases to be fun. So I don't want to live in a place where my fears are so big that I can't experience what the ocean has because the ocean is full of mystery and amazing treasures and some danger. Yeah. Well, and what you just said too, of, of the, you know, it's like the desire, like the desire that's bringing you into the water to do the triathlon or the, or just the desire of like, I would rather know the news, but I would rather laugh mm -hmm. than, uh, than cry, you know? Right. Yeah. And that sense of, we, we start to be able to trust that. And, and to me, this is such an important message because if we, you know, as, as the modern yoga world, it's like, as we, get grounded in our, like, how, how do we like to experience life? Like how much do we like to laugh each day or whatnot? We're, dri we're driving a new market. I mean, it's, it's you and I have both witnessed an amazing birth and growth of a global market. I don't know what, what it is this year, but like last year, I know that like the yoga industry was around $80 billion. Like it's not, wow, it's not huge. Right. But it's on the map. Like we're on the map, you guys, which is why I can go to my local grocery store in Idaho and get coconut water, you know, and I could <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and go to berries. I love that. And I, love I it. found fresh turmeric root there. It's a conventional wow. store. It's owned by a Mormon family in Idaho, but I can get fresh turmeric root. It's not organic That's there. Awesome. I have to go to the, the little niche store for that, but it's there. Right. Yeah. And we see like, oh my gosh, if we really tap into that, say we're not political, like, but we all are. Right. And if we can just see like, oh, I would rather get the news through SNL. Right. Mm -hmm. That you're creating a mark, you're creating a stronger market. You watch those videos on YouTube. There's money. You're actually driving money into a channel that you prefer and you're taking money out of another channel that you're not preferring, you know, and it's, it's so powerful. And with news and with media and with the reality of what's happening, when we see things, there's the knee jerk reaction, there's the reaction, and then there's the deeper layers of wisdom. And to be honest, I have a lot of compassion for a lot of the people that are doing 
that are leading the modern world right now, I have no idea what kind of stresses they have on them. I have no idea how much their individual will is able to be expressed. And people are talking shit left and right with very little information. And when you talk shit, you are feeling that energy and it can be productive. And it does, I don't believe in yogis need to only have happy thoughts. There's the whole rainbow of emotion. But I think the, the quick reaction to be mean, to, to talk in a way that's super demeaning, nobody deserves that to be the initial reaction. And if we can be true yogis, we can sit with things that are happening around us. We can breathe into who we are and we can be curious as to, I wonder why that's happening. Yeah. I wonder what this person's upbringing was. What was their mother like? What, what were their friends like in school? And I think compassion and curiosity can be such a strong tool to balance our current state of the world. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen. And, and for those who have parents, it's like when my kid comes home from school and like someone was mean or acting out and it's just, or someone is con you know, constantly misbehaving in class. We kind of go into that inquiry of like, I wonder where, you know, what her life's like, you know, and yeah. that's, it's something we can always, it's something we can really pass on as a skill set. So in closing, I want to ask about as, as your movement is gaining a lot of traction and I would imagine your life is continually evolving in ways that are, uh, in, you know, just it's it like change, right? But when there's a lot of dynamic growth happening, mm -hmm. where it involves a lot of people in life. And I, I just want to hear in terms of capacity building, this is something that uh, I, I'm noticing and just very curious about. How has your perspective of Dharma, like how is that evolving as you're able to have more impact as you're leading a tribe, as you're have, you know, even being on the Tim Ferriss shows, you're getting more exposure and getting out to a more a mainstream audience. Like how is, how is your sense of how, of your Dharma and of your, I would say even level of impact, how is that shifting? Well, it's expanding constantly. And, um, when I turned 40, I'm 42 now, when I turned 40, I went through, um, my list of accomplishments in my life and things that I still wanted to do. And one of the things that I wrote down is I want there to be a billion acro yogis before I leave this earth, before Maha Samadhi time. And that's a super huge goal. And I feel like what I'm constantly practicing is just being a human and being the best human that I can. And a lot of what I've experienced in the past, I'd say two years is going really deep in my relationships and not running from difficult situations, not shutting the door when people quote unquote hurt me. And just recently I, I had some romance, got together with an ex-girlfriend, thought things were going to be amazing. They weren't a lot of ups and downs. And one of my dear friends just showed up for me and was very human with me and gave me some love and support. And you know, if I didn't have my yoga practices, I probably wouldn't have been able to reopen my heart to an ex-girlfriend. And then I wouldn't have been able to be loving with her when things didn't go the way that I wanted them. So I feel like to a large degree, what I have to offer the world is my life practice of investing in relationships in a super deep way for many, many years and being able to help people understand that there are individual practices and there are partner practices that can help you get the most out of life. And what Tim Ferriss has done for the practice and what many other people have done is they've stepped into the practice and they've leveraged their own individual wisdom. So it's not them selling me or my product. It's them joining this movement of consciousness of individual self-knowledge and sharing that with each other. And that's the biggest gift that I can bring to the world is to give people tools so they can have a more full individual relationship with themselves and they can have more full relationships with the people around them. And that's, I'm, I'm in it for life. I'm, I'm 42. I've got at least another 42 years of doing very similar things and just giving people tools. Yeah. Awesome. And it's so uh, refreshing too, to, you know, this shift in perspective with our, with our generation, although we're seeing it too, with older entrepreneurs, the sense of there's no end game. Like the end game is just death. There's not like this, like hit the, hit 60 and retire, right? It's like, yeah. it's such a dharmic base. It's such as bringing the East and the West of, of impact and dharma together for the, the deeper fruition of vision. 
Yeah, and this is actually something I heard in one of Tim's podcasts. He talked about these people in Silicon Valley that will do a seven-year cycle of startups and they'll work 60, 80 hours a week. And as soon as they get done with one, they do the other. And they haven't been, little by little, learning how to relax and take a vacation. And I also have a crazy high work ethic. And everything I do is, quote unquote, work. Because everything I do brings the aspects that I love into my life. And to be able to be happy with your daily routine most days yeah. and to wake up and do the things that feed you and fill you. Most people have traded that in for money. And that is something that is, it's got some high uh, costs and people that have been able to have their careers and still speak to their deeper callings. That's a really beautiful thing that I want to be able to offer people is, you know, the way to balance your professional lives with your spiritual life with your body with your desires this is a uh, this is what i'm practicing and this is what i see other people becoming more aware of yeah amen to that and it's and it's an emerging i mean it's an emerging skill set and it's also to me it's a it's like if you're not experiencing that it's a sign that you're in an outdated model you know just like mm -hmm. if you're not able to connect with another person's breath body it's a sign that you're in an outdated you know model of yoga that doesn't also in include that and and just the sense of like, hey guys, like this is this is <laughs> this is where innovation's going. It's not a it's not a question, right? It's an arrow. And so mm -hmm. the sense of balance or harmonizing life to to Dharma and the money, you know, it's like follow your heart and the money will follow. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of good you know strategy <laughs> that's that's available now too with that that might yeah. not have been available in the seventies, right? With the you know different uh, and follow your heart and money will follow potentially and follow your heart and learn the Western business techniques that actually make sense and are not yeah. in diametrically opposed to your life balance. The that's, 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 a, really and that's the part. strategy, right? Like that's where mm -hmm. it's where we have, I mean, just like we were talking about in the beginning, like the mixture of, uh, of modern technology and ancient technology, right? Exactly. You have like the, a lot of the pranayama practice has been around for a very long time. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so we've had that technology. We've had the inner body, subtle body technology for for eons, and now we're getting this, uh, you know, the whatever the hyperconnectivity technology of just modern equipment, right? Where we're able to do that. And in the same way, it's like we have the concept of dharma that is so old, and yet we have this more modern concept of of reinvention. And then we have access to so many strategies from like all these different places, and you get to just pick and test and see what and see what works right and then learn from yesterday and then morph mm -hmm. and apply and see what's sticky and, and i move like that on. you said test and i think that's one of the most powerful things that i feel from the yoga practice that has influenced my life is this idea of rituals and you know each day i want to have the best morning i've ever had so i i wake up and I'm like, okay i'm gonna make my tea i'm gonna do the puer with the turmeric and the ginger and i'm gonna start my bath and i want to have the temperature just right and i want to put the essential oils in and then i want to have my meditation and then i want to do my asana practice and it's just constantly tweaking the the levels of all these different inputs that set me up for my ideal day and this is it, you have to test it and you have to be willing to let go of what you've done for a long time because every day you wake up you have a new list of imbalances that you get to do your best with your practices <laughs> to find your new center and be your best human. Yeah. Yeah. And like that's straight out of Silicon Valley too, right? Like lean startup of, of think big, test small, fail fast. Yeah. Uh -huh. Fail fast and learn. Uh huh. Right. Where you've got like the mix of like, oh, wait, that's our yoga. That's, that's Pragna Parada. It's just the modern interpretation. And guess what? It's actually, in many ways, it's a sutra, right? Uh huh. And it's kind of better. It's easier to absorb. Like it's easier to get that as yeah. a practice now than maybe some of the things we might find in. Yeah, and wisdom's just... wisdom. You know, wisdom is going to find many different avenues into the consciousness, whether it's through a comedian or a sutra, or just you wake up and you 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 meditate and you feel it and you find it and you tell your friend. They're like, oh yeah, that's a sutra. That's where the, all the sutras came from. It's from people sitting and feeling the wisdom that we're born with. Yeah. Amen. Well, I'm excited. I think I might I want to meet you. Well, I want to get you just, up in the air sometime. I was going to say, I I was looking at your schedule and I could probably get, swing Guadalajara because I live in Mexico part time. Awesome. Yeah. Come. I'm going to There's come. a festival at the end of the teacher training and it's all levels. 
It's uh, the teachers actually teach the first day. That's their their final exam, basically. And then all the facilitators teach the second day. So you should totally come. Excellent. Excellent. And we can do another live show then if you have a few minutes. So that would be, be awesome. Fun. What well, a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. Yay. As I bring this 1 million downloads episode to a close, I just want to thank the longtime listeners of the show, the people who've been here since... 2012, who put up with really bad audio quality, who put up with very long interviews that were sometimes boring or esoteric. And I just want to say thank you. Like, thanks for making the show a success. It's you. It's it's really you that as a listenership, as a collective here that are driving the conversation forward. It's It's for you that I grab the mic at least twice a week and talk with someone or talk by myself to you. And I'm just really glad for the conversation. I'm glad for the personal evolution and glad for our collective evolution. And that's really where the conversation is going next. Between 1 million and 2 million downloads, you're going to hear a lot more about collective leadership. You're going to hear a lot more about collective evolution. And you're going to you're just going to hear a lot more about what it takes to thrive and the pulsation between the feminine and the masculine and the return to what you know within your own self. Namaste. Have a great day. And thank you for celebrating with me. Yoga Healer Real Life Show with Kate Stillman. Yoga Healer.